So uh, thank you everybody for joining us this evening. I am excited to share with you a little bit of what PhysioU brings to the digital classroom and, um, and also to invite you into the conversation about how we can model some of the content or model some of the simulations to meet the PTA students needs better. And I think today I'll be able to show you even just yesterday, um, uh, Lori and I had talked about let's add some case studies specific to PTA. And so Lori put it together, the team programmed it in and then it is now in the app. So I'll give you a glimpse of that. That's how fast some of this can evolve especially based on your feedback and, con and, and, and you know, your vision of how we enhance education. So um, I've been teaching at APU uh, in the PT program for, uh, I think everybody knows this is all being recorded, so I just want, I always kind of let people know. Um, I've spent 17 years thinking about why is it so hard to turn these young students into clinicians? It's clearly, I'm delivering all the content. Something's missing uh, in between the content delivery and the creation of clinical reasoning. Uh, young clinicians who can make good decisions and, and take care of, safely take care of patients. So my specialty training is in orthopedics. That's where I've done my uh, residency and fellowship. I teach for these fellowships now, as well as for the USC Spine Fellowship using these apps. And uh, building this type of digital software has been a dream of mine because it overcomes the challenges of pictures and words and chapters because much of our thinking is not sequential in that in that way. So I'm going to show you a little bit about first why we did it. One is we realized that the students will never make as much as they're spending. So we were really concerned about that within our faculty and we decided are there certain types of textbooks or that we, we just couldn't get the job done as well as we wanted. Could we augment them? Or in some cases, are there, are there resources that just we didn't need to use anymore? And so you'll see that a lot of these apps are built around the motor skills, the learning of concepts like gait patterns that you could just watch once and the student would understand it. But they could read about it 10 times and still not understand it. Think about time efficiency and learning. So we were very concerned about cost, which is why you'll see that our cost is really low for students. And we also were worried about resources that get shelved. So things that new additions always came out, we'd always have to update the new edition. Today, with this technology, we are making changes and making this a better and better learning tool day by day. So I believe that that's the future. I, my intention is to not have to use certain books, my book, my own book included, because there's new ways to help students learn. We also want to make sure that we had resources that were mobile, that followed the student from the first day of their class throughout the curriculum. So imagine you are in your orthopedic rehabilitation class, but you can open the app and draw their attention back to the assessment of range of motion for the shoulder or assessment of range of motion for the neck. Like the resource is ex expands beyond the boundaries of, your, of the silos that our curriculum is built out of. And also we thought a lot about, could we make the instructor's lives easier by creating lots of high quality video driven resources so that the students would have a new method of learning motor skills. The old method, which was come to lab and I will show you my magic. Now the new method, and today especially, is please watch these videos before you come to class. Please try some of these techniques out before we meet online. And now when we watch the videos for the third time, the questions that you bring up, the context that I can create, all of that will enhance learning, enhance organization, enhance recall. All of that is part of the dream of why we built PhysioU. And in some of the apps as well, you'll see that we have created patterns, patient pictures that help the students to recognize, oh, that's what a knee OA person looks like. No wonder he has lack, lack of range of motion. No wonder the PT has done a range of motion assessment and the interventions are primarily stretching and mobilizations and modalities that actually help to enhance tissue extensibility. 
all of these, the context, I think, is another really key area of how we create clinicians. The techniques alone really just create overburdened, heavy technique-laden clinicians who really don't know who, what these techniques are for, who they're for. The other thing I want to mention before I show you into the apps, so I know I have about 15 minutes left here, is that all of these apps are built with faculty members that I have handpicked because they are experts in their field. Now that doesn't mean that there aren't mistakes, but remember those mistakes I'm correcting. The, the few that we have, we are correcting over the air updates all the time. So the resource can only get better and better. So PhysioU is actually a collection of apps that can augment your online curriculum. And I'll show you, I'm gonna bring you there right now. But what I want you to see is that we have been building this and refining this since 2013. Like I've been dreaming about it. We planned for it for a couple of years, 2011. It took us a whole year to build one app to reflect the clinical practice guidelines for low back pain. And then we slowly got faster we finished the orthopedic series, and now we moved into hitting a number of different apps that includes cardiopalm, neuro, therapeutic exercises, modalities, uh, physical agents we just released on Monday, developmental milestones. So eventually the bulk, and even at this point, the bulk of your curriculum, we can support. So here is, uh, I've reclustered the apps in little groups. So here is PhysioU apps for your fundamental skills. You have your physical agents, assistive devices, and transfers. Um, here is your range of motion manual muscle test and your gait analysis. We have a couple more that are coming down the pipe that will be fun for the students to do, um, but uh, some functional movement apps, some gait analysis apps. And then in the neuro environment, you have pediatrics, you have, we have a number of neuro patients demonstrating their gait deviations. And then here you have your neuro exam app. Very soon, I'm hoping within the next couple of weeks, we'll be releasing the neuro rehab app and within a month, the PNF app. So all of the techniques you need to teach neuro curriculum, all covered. Here is the orthopedic content. You'll know that we have a special test app. I'll show you that, the orthopedic app. We have a therapeutic exercises app that's coming out. And then we have, you know, functional movement analysis and splinting. So, I mean, there is enough here that you're gonna have to pick and choose from to augment and customize to your classroom and your, your curriculum. And then lastly, the acute care and cardiopulmonary content. Here is the cardiopulmonary app the lines and tubes app. So what I'm going to do here, just for a moment, and I'm going to end with this data here just to share with you what, what our students experience related to using the apps. So I'm going to stop share for a second. I'm going to go to my Zoom, my um, app. Okay, so I'm going to share again, just to make sure I'm sharing. Okay, here we go, perfect. So here, what I want you to see is each of you have full faculty access. That means you have unlimited use of all of our apps because we want to make your classroom engaging. We want to minimize the strain on your need to create video content. So let me start with the fundamentals. Just a quick glimpse. Here's the Range of Motion MMT app. Imagine that before class starts, the students could have a lab handout that invites them to palpate on themselves all the common bony landmarks. So you have soft tissue palpation as well as bony landmark palpation. These are all videos with instructions and a connection back to the anatomy that they study. So we're always thinking about how do you bridge the gap bridge between content, between classes. We want them always to feel connected. This will also have manual muscle test. You can see all the muscles here, videos, and potential alternative tests, including the grading. 
And finally, your basic neuro screen and, and range of motion. So here's your neuro screen. So this is all part of our clinical skills class that we just finished this last semester. If you move on into something like assistive devices, so let me take you to the assistive devices. You can see that we can now teach students to learn the process of fitting people to cr crutches. These are all instructional videos. We can teach them gait patterns. So we'll ask them to review this before coming to class so that in their mind they already have a picture of what modified three-point gait looks like. All of these are filmed right and left leg because we use this to train patients as well. So all of these videos can be emailed to the patient. Eventually we want to teach the, the, the patients how to get up and down the stairs in their home. So they're using crutches, left extremity is non-weight bearing, here is the video of ascending and then another video of descending. So think about what that means for clinical practice, but also how much easier it will be for you to teach the students while they're in, their, in the online space. So we're even thinking about making sure every student has a pair of uh, two umbrellas. You're going to have to try out a bunch of these gait patterns using the umbrellas because I want you to try it out now because I don't want boot camp in fall to be the first time you try this. This app also includes bed mobility. It will include sit to stand, stand to sit, or transfers, all your basic transfers. And we film this at its very simplest level, meaning it is the basics of how you do it so that you can augment it when you're with them in your online sessions. But it's nice to be able to just watch the video and talk them through it, or even allow the instructor here to talk them through it. All right, so I'm going to move on to just a special test app that might be useful for your orthopedic curriculum. Pretty much all the common special tests are here organized by purpose. Here's your rotator cuff tear test. Everything is linked to their PubMed abstract. And you can always just go to all shoulder tests and they're organized from A to Z. I think what would be really useful here is to give you a quick glimpse at the new modalities app that we've just released. We knew that it would be challenging for us to teach modalities, so we thought that it would be useful if we were able to film the common setup so here's the purpose for all your common modalities. A video of me narrating the setup. Preparation for lumbar traction. We are going to apply the pelvic belt directly on the skin of the patient. But if you don't want to waste seven and a half minutes of your life on this, you can actually use the high speed video and narrate over what you want to talk about. This is also broken up into the picture gallery where you can click through the pictures and talk about the different parts. Your contraindications and precautions are here. We are working on an update right now so you could hover over each contraindication and a description will come up because everybody knows half of these even I don't understand. Well, I understand them, but you know many of our students don't understand them. And we also have the setup information, the settings, basic patient education so that our students will know how to explain to the patient why we're using this, what it should feel like. And here are some questions for the patient to look over to make sure that they are appropriate for this type of treatment. And we always create a case study for you. So, Based on some of the feedback from one of our fa uh, faculty uh, colleagues, we are now adding new questions to the case study. So it's not as simple as what, are, what modality is indicated for this guy with leg pain or back pain. It is now going to have something always goes wrong when I use these modalities 
what should I do next? Right? So if you think about someone with a hot pack that says, you know, this is getting way too hot, what do I do? So, or someone's using the ultrasound and the bone is beginning to hurt. What should they do? Lower the intensity, move the, ultra, the ultrasound applicator head. So we're adding in questions even as we speak to enhance the clinical reasoning to make it more relevant for our student learners. This is based on feedback from actually the bulk of you uh, PTA faculty as well as PT faculty who have said it's not just good enough for them to know how to start, do it and, and ask the right questions. We really need them to be able to troubleshoot on the fly. Um, maybe I'll give you a quick glimpse into the Neuro app. The Neuro app has every examination technique. So our students learn about balance by watching videos ahead of time. How am I going to test balance? They watch the video, we watch it together, they try it with somebody at home. That is the power of having all of these videos at your disposal. That includes the cardiopalm content. All the physical exam and ex intervention techniques in particular are here for you so that even though it's hard for you to show it online, you can just direct them di to these different techniques and even show them based on the types of patients. We have created these clusters. Every orthopedic app has these same clusters. So what you'll see is that the, 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 the app actually has a patient, this is a, a simulated patient, telling her story about her legs being swollen, her fatigue, her breathlessness. And so the interventions that you can talk about here are now very specific to that patient profile. This is why I think it helps the student to, to recognize why I'm doing these interventions. How does, it, how does it connect to the type of patient? If you look at our Lines and Tubes app, we wanted to familiarize our students related to all of, this, uh, all of these common lines and tubes. So here is a type of line and tube. This is what it's for. This is why they use it. And here are some rehab implications to be aware of. So Lori yesterday, or actually I think, I think it was yesterday, sent us a case. She said, I would love to integrate some cases. Here's the physical therapy assistant case so that the students have to think, here's the case. I want them to think about what findings are consistent with post-op hypotension. How would you access the current patient status information before providing therapeutic interventions? I would do the chart review. I would talk to the nurse. You collect vital sign data. Is the patient safe to ambulate? So all of these little discussions can be happening in your online environment so that it is not just a one-way flow of information. The students should look forward to playing therapist with you as their guide. So there's more apps than I can show you. I'd be, I would direct you actually to a couple of deep dive webinars. I want to just finish my last two or three minutes here. I'm going to stop share and move back to my PowerPoint just to show you some of the data that we collected on how you potentially could, what the students are experiencing with these apps. So I'm, let me share screen one more time and I will just finish off my part. Do I, do I have a couple more minutes, Jennifer? I think so. Okay, so let me go here. What you'll see is we presented this at ELC. In fact, that's where I met many of you. Um, and we asked the question, um, one, are you buying the textbooks that we've asked you to buy? 80% of them said we're buying less than 40% of the textbooks required or recommended. One, they're expensive. Two, we don't like to read. Well, I tell the students, you know what? There are many things that you need to learn and becoming a clinician partly is getting through some of this data. But certainly, I can build apps to help fill in those gaps. So recognize that the students are beginning to choose their learning resource of choice. When we asked them, how did these apps help you? Many said, it really helped me with mastery and confidence. I love seeing the videos of the techniques, 
knowing what's coming down the pipe, not worrying about videotaping or getting a good view of the technique. It helps me to learn with less anxiety. Many said when we play through the apps together, I get to see a pattern. So if, when, what I didn't get to show you is the orthopedic app. The orthopedic app can walk them through the examination that the therapist would have done, the differential diagnosis that we have to worry about, the interventions, manual therapy, therapeutic exercises, modalities, all of that is linked within a patient pattern. So when they get to see that and they understand the place that they play, the role that they play in the rehab process, it is so much easier for them to transition into the clinic. They've seen all these patients before. So it really helps them with higher level learning, clinical reasoning, making decisions. I think a lot of the case studies, we have cardiopulmonary case studies as well. And they talked a lot about reduced anxiety in lab. They felt like they learned faster, right? When they see the technique for the first time with you in lab is the old model. Today's model is they have exposed themselves to the techniques. They have in fact been empowered to try some of these basic things on people. And then they see the technique and allow, now you have a rich environment to build context. And then development as a student clinician, they felt like that really helped them. So this question always comes up. We ask the students to support the development of, the, of these apps. It's $54 a year. So for a PTA program, we, it's $108 and we give them an extra year when they're in the clinic because we think that's a critical time for them to still have their resources. All faculty have free full access. If you haven't already gotten access, please feel free to email me at mike at physiou.com. So this is where the students would go to, to, to um, we, on our webpage, there's a student tab. You could invite your students just to go there and decide for themselves if this is what they want to get unless you're requiring it. Many of the PTA programs are ordering it in bulk so that all the students will have it throughout the curriculum. The last thing I would say is because of COVID-19, we've decided to make all the apps available to the students for free. So all the way through summer semester, August 15, as long as you sign up through our coronavirus, so physiou.com coronavirus, we will we will give access codes to all of your students so they don't even have to worry and you don't even have to think twice about can, should I use these videos you can use them already in your classroom but the students will have access full access to all the apps it's the least that we could do to minimize the disruption and stress that they're going through this is a deep dive series of webinars so depending on the classes that you teach if you go to the deep dive series here in our faculty resources, educator faculty resources, you will see a deep dive series of webinars. That is where you can learn more about how different programs are utilizing our apps. And I think I will just hand it off now uh, to many of your colleagues who are already doing this. So I'm excited as well to hear all the innovation that is going on in, in PTA education. So thank you so much for giving me a moment to share. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. You're going to hang on, right? I, I will be here for questions. I'd like to, okay, we'll save those to the end so that the other presenters have an opportunity and then we'll make sure everybody's questions get answered before. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. I think, Carrie, are you up next or Lori? Well, I'm going to, if I can share my screen. Uh, it's not exactly what I wanted to share. Um, so we thought we would frame, my name is Lori Daigle. Um, I am the program director of the PTA program at Germana Community College and two other colleagues of ours are included in this presentation, uh, Kathy Menti and Carrie Weatherspoon, just to put together a little bit of how we are using Physio U. Um, so Mike has really covered a lot of these things, but we gathered some thoughts of our own um, about why this, what the benefit is to the students to using PhysioU. I have been using it for um, about three years, 
and watched it grow from um, just a few videos to how many videos do you have now? We probably have close to 5,000. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Um, anyway, they have instant access anywhere. Standing in line at the grocery store when we could do that. Uh, at your son's soccer game when we can do that. Instant access. The videos are short. They're very clean. They're very visible. What I like particularly, I know I'm not the only one who has students who when they start giving patient instructions, they say, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do, we're, we're gonna, and, and we're gonna, <laughs> right? There's this very concise speech that's consistent throughout the videos and I love that particular part. It's a trusted source. It limits them going out and trying to find random videos on Google, some of which are fine and some of which um, don't necessarily conform to what we're trying to teach them. Hey, Lori. I just wanted to let you know that we're not seeing your PowerPoint. We're just seeing a, oh, no. a Word document. you back breakout. So you might need to stop sharing and then reshare your PowerPoint. Yeah. I am so sorry. No, That's no okay. problem. That's okay. God, and I had them flying in and everything. That's okay. There we go. You can go back through and fly them back in. Is that better? Yeah, yes. that's better. Yep. Sorry about that. Okay. That's okay. So here, here these things have flown in. Um, uh, and we'll go on. So it does reduce textbook costs. We very quickly um, did away with a goniometry book. I know that was one of the first ones to go when I was done in PT school. It's so very specific, um, not necessary. Uh, we've done away with um, a patient skills, basic patient skills. So they're all right here. Um, and it's just really affordable for the students. I haven't had a single complaint about that. All right, so now I can't, there it goes. Um, it's a resource they can take into any of their clinical experiences, okay? So we bring our students to a free clinic. They ask a question, well, what is that? Look on PhysioU, find me something. So students who have less experience, you know, we all have the ones who have been techs for a while and they come already having seen these things. The ones who don't have that experience, I think, suffer sometimes. Um, and this really allows them to see that professional um, presentation of different skills before we do it, either in the classroom or online. And it also gives students with more experience than the ability to go, well, wait a minute, what's that link to? Oh, okay, I get that. Um, they're free to explore, and they really do like to explore. And it's game-like. You know, we hear, we, we talked about gamification on a seminar, on a webinar not too long ago. Um, they like that. They like being able to explore and learn. I know we have an anatomage table, um, which now we don't have access to, but I didn't have to do anything really to prepare with that. The students just get in there and they explore. Repetition. They can watch it over and over. I don't get that. I forgot that. Whatever. Over and over, that repetition we know is good for learning. Um, real quickly, we're going to talk about some benefits to faculty. Again, reliable videos. I love that there are the information, all the, you know, the settings for the traction, all the things Mike has already shown you. Um, uh, what the reliability of a test is. Okay, let's talk about what is reliability. Um, it crosses the curriculum. It really can help guide the students in clinical reasoning through the case studies and some of the other um, newer apps where there's really some um, interaction. Someone had asked the question on chat about whether the students see the answers where there's the... Um, uh, a little magnifying glass. They, they, they can, but if you instruct them, try to answer it yourself and then um, look at that. But then there are some other um, interactive um, simulation studies that, are, that um, Mike and his team are working on where they have to answer questions, and if they answer it wrong, 
they have to find their way back. Um, and again, context. I'm, I'm a firm believer that without the context, you know, they can learn everything about a cane and a walker and a crutch, and they don't see how it applies because they haven't been in the clinic in those early um, CIs can use it to direct the students to look information up on their own. Students prefer interactive learning. Um, in our normal times, watching videos before lab makes our face-to-face -face instruction faster. Now during quarantine, it really provides the next best thing to live demonstration and quite honestly, sometimes better because we all know that in PTA education in particular, we're asked to teach things that are maybe not in our complete expertise. Um, so it gives us more knowledge and confidence <clears throat> in our teaching. And one of the benefits to us is Michael Wong, who's sitting right there. You want to see something? You ask Mike. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to have a hashtag. Ask Mike. Ask Mike. So that's um, a little bit from now. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen for now. And now um, Carrie is going to talk to us about how she uses it. Okay, so now I'm going to share my screen, hopefully. Uh, so can everybody see it? Yep. Okay. Uh, so um, hi, I'm Carrie Bonner Witherspoon. Um, I'm at Radford University Carilion. We were Jefferson College of Health Sciences. Uh, we're located in Virginia. We were that before we merged with Radford last year. So uh, I have been, uh, this is my 11th year as full time core faculty. I was an adjunct for two years uh, prior to that. Uh, and so I'm just going to give you a quick overview of how we kind of utilized it. Um, and you probably won't have time. I'll give you a short little timeline. Um, but these are the main four kind of ways that we utilize it uh, within our courses. Uh, it's again, it's very easy to kind of implement at the basic level. You can definitely just dip your toe in, try a couple of things to start with. And then as you get more comfortable, as the students get more comfortable with the technology and how it's organized, uh, you can start doing more advanced, more complex type assignments. Uh, and activities. Um, mine's going to be a little bit more of an overview, and I know Kathy and Lori are going to go into some really specific um, examples to help you uh, as well. Uh, so one of the ways is we use it as kind of as a simulated patient. Uh, so if the, in the ortho, and I need to share. So I will show you a couple of little, so can you guys see the physio U now? Yep. yep. Uh, so one of the ways that we'll do, so I teach the ortho section, so movement faults. I'm going to make it big, uh, super easy to pause and uh, mute. So a lot of times I may start with this and do it as a muted and play it on the screen in front of the lab, or you can do this online. Uh, as well, and I might just let it kind of play, have the students problem solve. What do you see? What's going on? So you're working on their observation. Uh, so then it gives you that kind of kind of simulated patient. Um, obviously, then he then goes and shows how uh, to correct. I will a lot of times pause it here, bring it back to the beginning, and play the video so that they can hear. What did you see? This is when you can also explore. This is from one angle. Uh, so I might also talk about what are you, what would you see from the front or what are some other potential movements that you may see. So again, you can just really expand it out. It can be a great like kind of step off. Um, again, especially as you get more comfortable with it. Um, I'm also going to show you, so we'll do like clinical findings. Uh, these are great. Again, uh, we'll utilize them. Oops, I'm going to mute it and let it start rolling. And you can hear, hear my talk, talking. Uh, let's let me get it plain. Uh, so what what they can do a lot of times with the clinical findings is I'll have them uh, watch that prior to class. And so it gives those uh, students, um, he's explaining a lot of what you would expect to see. 
um, over that, then uh, they're going to act out. So again, the students can hear, uh, see typical kind of presentations. Um, he's going to talk about, oh, it's a Gower sign. So now you actually get to see that Gower sign. Uh, and the students, especially those with a less clinical, uh, clinical base, they're going to be able to see and be prepared. So again, it's that kind of that lay, leveling the playing field uh, for your students with less clinical and uh, oops, let me get back up. Uh, less clinical experience, but also they can watch that and they're getting prepared and then they hear it um, again, that repetition as well. Uh, cardio poem. Uh, Again, I'm gonna mute. Again, lots of great information that's coming on. I'm just muting so I can talk so that you guys get to see a lot of different things. Uh, but the chart review, so they get to see um, an EM, uh, an electric, uh, electronic medical chart. And so they can be exposed to that. Uh, but again, it also explains stuff uh, over top. So if I bring to, important information about the patient's current status. Elevated BNP is associated with heart failure. Troponin levels rise with cardiac infarction. Comparing current blood gas results to normal tells us that the patient is in respiratory or metabolic acidosis. So again, just being able to do that, you hear you have this chart that you can play with, and again, you can bring it into the classroom. Again, these are easily translated into that into the um, off-site uh, online classrooms as well. So they're gonna be able to see that. Uh, the case studies will also utilize. I have a problem, I, I'm a smoker for 50 years and I have a smoker's cough. <coughs> and I can hardly breathe because, and my legs are swollen. I just don't feel that great. So again, nice, nice, short, clear video. We can utilize this and say, okay, so what did you hear? So they're getting practice on learning. What did you hear him say? Okay, oh, swollen legs. So what do you think some causes? So it's a great little like jumping off that you can use. And then again, there's lots of good information down here. And just like you saw with the other apps to be able to do the clinical reasoning. Now you can jump off either further like in class, but again, having the students look at it prior to and have them work on, well, let's, let's do this test. So again, really easy to interject these into to a lecture. Um, it's gonna be active. Uh, again, a lot of times our, our students uh, that are uh, in the physical therapist assistant, they haven't had the really, they just kind of, we call it zombie studying. Uh, they just kind of, uh, well, I looked over the PowerPoint 17 times. Uh, but they never really interacted with it and were actively involved. And we know that's important for learning and having those active quizzing. And so it's nice and easy. So again, follows right into um, our what we're what we have learned about learning. Uh, and so being able to use that and have them be able to do that quick quiz is is great um, as well. And it it brings it to life. So it's not just I'm reading a textbook. Here I've got a person. Uh, the gate is also, so you saw some of the gate. Uh, so one of the things that's really awesome with the gate is they have, especially for, is the prosthetic. Uh, so we've got uh, these again, they're on a green screen. So it takes all that background out. So the students aren't having to do that. You didn't have to spend uh, 15 um, hours searching YouTube uh, to find a good demonstration. It's right there. It's easy. They're fast. The ones with the little uh, magnifying glass uh, is going to be in slow motion. Uh, so again, the students can see it from all sides. They can see it at regular speed. They can see it in slow motion. So you can really be able to, to utilize that. And then again, they're just adding more case studies as they're, as they're filming. Uh, so again, I always come back and explore like, oh, great. Like each semester when I come back in, I'm like, oh, there's even new and new and exciting case studies. So being able to pull that out uh, is is all very uh, helpful as well. Uh, the other, let me stop share for a second. Share back to my PowerPoint. 
The next one we kind of used it as is as an extra instructor. We always could use that, you know, extra faculty member there. Uh, and so I'll use it a lot of times as kind of the extra instructor. So in our clinical assessment course that we teach manual muscle testing, range of motion and balance assessments, and just like Lori, uh, we also are no longer using a goniometry textbook. This, this replaces the goniometry uh, textbook as well. These are ways that we can potentially use it. So let me So if we look at the, uh, say, wrist extension, and again, I've got him on, I've muted him so that you guys can kind of hear it talk over. I'll put this up on the screen. Uh, so we have class, our class is 10 to 12 students uh, in the lab. And so I'll have them watch this prior to coming in. If they haven't had the palpation already and they're functional, they can go into the palpation like Mike is showing you on uh, on the screen. So review your palpations before you come to class. Watch this one time. Uh, super easy again to pause without. So I'll be like, okay, let's set a minute. What is the position? And so they get, so I can pause it. They can set up uh, one, they work in pairs. So have one of the pair uh, be the patient to start with. They're there, they're set up. Um, and then I'll actually have them run through uh, together. So I can let this play. I can pause, I can check and run through. Okay, did you find the, the, the position? Um, they're gonna work on it. And so now this, the instructor and I'm the, the teaching assistant running through and be like, are you really on the trichotrum? Um, do you have that lined up? Oh, you're on the radial side. Uh, so again, it gives you that extra set of hands because they're gonna be able to, to go through that. Um, and then again, then we'll just switch pairs. I'll let it either run or sometimes uh, the second, when we switch the second uh, pair or switch out to the second patient, uh, they're gonna, again, now, I might put this up on the screen. And so now they're seeing the words while they're actively doing it. And so you, you again can utilize, okay, so they're looking at the words. Um, What's that normal range of motion? Uh, again, you can quiz those as you're going along and you've got that up as, as kind of, so you're double, they're hearing it verbally, they're seeing it uh, as well. So again, you can really kind of delve into some of that, that learning um, as well. That should be my Okay, and um, I use it also as a resource for kind of some independent work as well. Uh, so case studies, there's a lot of case studies in there. Uh, Lori's gonna go into a little bit more detail about some case studies, but one of the things I'll do in ortho is I give them a, uh, I'll give them a PT eval and tell them to independently, okay, so what's gonna be your first treatment with them? Like, so give me five units, um, I want you to give me five billable units of what you would do. Um, they're gonna follow the diagnosis so they can learn about the diagnosis in more detail, uh, the prevalence, uh, uh, differential diagnosis and those type of things so they can be familiar with that. And then they can look at what are some interventions, what's some patient education, uh, what outcome measures would I expect them to do? And so again, they can utilize it that way. Uh, in my neuro course, I use it as independent lab station. So we have a larger lab for our neuro. So I have a, a teaching assistant that's with me as well as a clinician uh, out in the real world. And uh, so what we'll do is we have about 15 in those classes. So what we'll do is a lot of times is I'll break up into stations. And so we'll have three stations uh, and, and I'll play a patient and say, I'm a CVA uh, that they're working on gait training with. Uh, the other station, the teaching assistant, is she's she may do um, uh, she may be doing transfers and bed mobility with a hemiplegic patient. And then the third station is okay. You guys are going out in the hallway. You're going to set up the six minute walk test and do that. And then they can rotate through. So again, um, it gets them practicing on doing some stuff independently uh, so that they feel comfortable. Uh, if it's not something, because we obviously can't teach them every single outcome measure, every single test. Uh, so having them learn and practice and be comfortable with, oh, I can I can grab this and I can learn this, and they're working in a low risk with low uh, uh, with a group to be able to kind of do that. 
uh, group projects. Uh, so one of the things, and, and I think we're sharing these uh, PowerPoints, or I'm fine to share them. If, if it's not going as a group, I will definitely, if you email me, I can share that. Um, balance assignment and so we divide up our class this is in my clinical assessment and we divide them up into three groups uh, which they perform each group performs a different uh, balance test that we didn't go over specifically in class and they do it to each other and then we kind of talk about inter-rater reliability practice doing the setup and those type of things um, so it helps them kind of do some critical thinking as well and then like Lori said it's kind of a resource for that student that wants more uh, so those patients that have more clinical experience and they're asking you those um, nice to know or crazy to know questions, uh, you can kind of refer, well, look at this. You can definitely come and see me at office hours, um, but look at this. This gives you some more information. Um, or again, it gives it that opportunity for those students that are in their first year uh, that want to, want to know, oh, well, how does this relate to ACL? Or I just sprained my ankle. Um, what are some good exercises? So they'll start playing around uh, as well. So that's kind of helpful uh, as well. And then uh, we use it as a resource for review. So I know none of your pay, none of your students ever say like, oh, I don't know how, I don't know how, which leg goes up first to when we're doing gait training uh, because that was two semesters ago. Uh, so again, it lets them review that prior covered knowledge. So Prior to physio, you would be like, well, go grab your Pearson and like, well, I didn't buy the Pearson or um, they're going to forget to go look it up because it's on the bookshelf at home because they definitely didn't haul it into, into school. Uh, so it lets them instantaneously kind of do that review of the prior cover knowledge of stuff that they should, should have already um, learned and been responsible for. Um, it gives also, so you saw the multiple situations uh, for the gate training on the stairs. Um, the, sometimes, again, we have students that have a little bit of difficulty with the application and synthesis, synthesis component. Um, so they have a hard time. Well, how am I going to do this with a cane? Or we don't want to have to show them. This is how you do it with right leg. This is how you do it with left leg. This is how you do it with a cane. This is how you do it with crutches. Um, so they can, again, watch those again and be like, oh, okay. Um, so that's going to be helpful or in ortho we do the soft tissue so we may do in lab practice the soft tissue of the upper trap and i'm like and then if you're interested because the principles are the same um but i'm not going to go over every muscle i'm like well guess what levator scapula they have the soft tissue for that so watch the physio you so again it gives them some concrete examples um, of multiple situations we kind of again talked about it being able to level the playing field um, we'll utilize it prior to remediation. So you didn't pass um, the shoulder scapular, manual muscle test, goniometry. I need you to go back and review these um, prior to coming in uh, to meet with me and prior to us doing your retake. Um, so again, just kind of gives them that solid. Uh, for that same reason, the MISC class, uh, the clinicals. Uh, the other thing that we'll use is kind of that I use it as kind of quizzing reviewing. So uh, you guys saw the special test. Well, I'll put the special test up on the screen. You got to put it up as full screen first uh, and I'll have it on mute uh, so that they don't see what it's a test of. So I may pull up like the valgus test of the knee and I'll pull it up and be kind of like, OK, so what's because um, special tests just always tend to flip out the students and there's just so much and I'm never going to get. So I'll pull that up. OK, okay what is this? Can you recognize what this special test is? Well, why do you think they're doing that? So sometimes that's kind of helpful too, because we really like to use our special test uh, much more so for them to kind of as a, as a reinforcement for uh, the anatomy. Uh, so that's uh, kind of uh, where, we, where we are. Um, and again, uh, I'm running right at the end, uh, but just wanted to see, again, I've been doing it for quite a while. The good thing is, is I think when we started, there were only like three or four apps. Um, so as I started adding, I'm just, I've been able to like add them in a little bit as we go. Um, and again, uh, we started out with just using them in as, as an in-class resource, then started to get them to require um, they are replacing um, our text. We did it with the goniometry. Um, we haven't yet given up Pearson for, uh, for uh, the basic skills, but we were talking about doing that. 
Uh, and then uh, I've definitely given up uh, some of our smaller, like the uh, ortho notes that I was using for lab and ortho, we're now utilizing this. Uh, so again, cost effective wise, it's great. Uh, the other thing that we've been able to do, luckily I've got a lot of relationships with the, the other faculty at our college, uh, did a lot like kind of got the uh, DPT, our uh, Radford University's DPT program, uh, set, set them off. They're doing some really cool research with uh, physio use. If you don't know about that, my, I'm pretty sure you do. That's uh, awesome. And uh, the, the MOST, OT, and OTA. So again, it's, it's kind of really great. I know our uh, OT was very excited about the splinting uh, and again, uh, we start getting some, some more uh, standardization uh, throughout. So that's kind of that. And I will quit talking. I just made it just under 20 minutes. Uh, so I will stop sharing. And um, I know Kathy and Lori are going. Okay. Um, so I was going to... Here's what I want to do first. So for those of you who have not been to PhysioU um, at this point, um, even before you sign in, there is an educator tab right here. And if you go down to faculty resources, you're going to see some important things. First of all, you're going to see these webinars. Um, I highly recommend that you take some time to register for and go to these webinars. Um, every time I go to one, I learn something new about how to navigate in the app. The next thing that's on here is incredible. So this is a spreadsheet uh, with all the different apps and all the different videos in all the different apps, okay? So if you are working on developmental milestones and you want to uh, use uh, a link here, you can just copy the link. Copy the link, you put it in a document. Um, go watch this video. You can change the name of the link as, you know, month zero supine. Okay, um, so it is really a pretty user-friendly, um, that particular part is very user-friendly. Oh, I want to go back to that one more time. So the other thing you need to look at there, under faculty resources, um, is under teaching content. And Mike being the incredibly generous person that he is with all their work has created these um, worksheets, lab worksheets. They open up in Google Docs for you to use and change as you like. And it is such a great uh, format. Um, they have the ICF categories on all of this, which helps us, you know, talk to them about how how does that? How does this relate to a patient's um, I see uh, a patient's function? Um, linking to the videos. So this one may already have one linked. This is where you would go in and drop that link that you just copied. And I would just say, Lori, yeah. here that this worksheet here can be augmented by faculty so that you can draw, it's like a scavenger hunt. It gives the students the ability to wander through the app and gather information that you think is relevant that you want them to begin to play through on their own. So it, it's really a way for the students to familiarize themselves and really to contextualize all the little special tests, all the little interventions and stretches and strengthening exercises, all of that can be contextualized if you just augment, if you take that worksheet and say, guys, we're in shoulder week. I want you to see what a frozen shoulder looks like and how that's different from a shoulder impingement. Okay, so can everybody see this screen? So I used that to create 
a lab worksheet for uh, my intro class coming up where we introduce two different um, functional outcomes measures, the timed up and go and a five times sit to stand. So I've given them for this very first one, um, the ICF categories. Um, I have the video there, watch that video. I've given them some questions to think about. What activities or movements or function does this assess? What equipment do you need? What space do you need? How much time does it take? Who is it appropriate for? How would you ensure safety? If they perform poorly, what kind of function might they have trouble with? When would you retest? What kinds of interventions would be appropriate? Okay. Um, then they have to practice and discuss any difficulties. And then what I'm asking them to do is to select one other video to watch in the gate test section. And that just links to the whole um, gate test site. So then they scroll down and go, well, let me do this verb or whatever. And then they have to describe similarities and differences. And so we can talk about that online if they do the pre-work. So that's how I've used this lab work. I mean, I learned about this lab worksheet, oh, maybe two weeks ago, and I have already, it has made my life so much simpler just giving the context related to physio use. So indebted to Mike um, for all of that, as always. So um, I think that's all I'm going to, to share about because I want Kathy to have a chance to talk. She's been mute. Let me unmute myself. And please somebody shout out to me. I've had um, a fragile internet connection um, and it always comes up at the most ridiculous times. So if I sound choppy, somebody yell at me. Um, we uh, started our use of PhysioU kind of suddenly. Uh, we were faced with um, an updated shelter in place order that became very clear that our first clinical rotation was not going to happen. And we had already postponed it two times, um, you know, in the anticipation that these things were going to continue happening. Um, so um, I had just learned about PhysioU one week prior to that. Um, I fortunately was able to get a quick meeting uh, with Michael Wong. Uh, he helped me um, just kind of collect and hone my ideas for what uh, replacement to a clinical environment might look like. Um, so, because we, what we needed to provide was an environment for students to have an opportunity to look at a case study and critically uh, review what the PT initial evaluation looked like, um, anticipate what their patient would look like, um, as well as how to prepare themselves for each treatment session. You know, the, these are the things that would have happened during their clinical rotation. Now it needed to be happening in their home. Um, I wanted them to have opportunities to make mistakes and talk out how to correct them, what to anticipate and when to report back to the primary PT if uh, something interesting popped up that they weren't expecting. So uh, we created this clinical readiness course um, that started uh, with an overview of Physio U that actually um, the founder and CEO of Physio U, Michael Wong, uh, provided for my students. Uh, just so kind of an intro to the navigation. Um, and then every two days we would focus on common diagnoses found in a specific body region. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up my screen. Share that. So, uh, so we would pull up, a, we would start focusing on a different body region and um, during the online class, I would facilitate a discussion uh, with regards to pain patterns, uh, physical exam findings, movement faults, red flags, and, um, and we would utilize the physio U program. So I would share my screen and I would pull up physio U and click on uh, the clinical pattern recognition um, in the ortho section. And, and then we have body parts. 
So then we would look through and I would zero in on a particular um, pain pattern and I'd say, okay, let's look, look at this pain pattern here. And I may have just accidentally clicked on it, so I'm going to go back a screen because that's not where we would go initially. Where we would go initially is we would look at that pain pattern and I would ask students, okay, throw out some diagnoses. What do you think is happening with this patient if you saw that? Uh, my computer is not cooperating with me. Um, and I would have them sh shout out some diagnoses. So they would say, I think it's this, I think it's that, it might be this, it might be that. I would give them an opportunity to process that. Um, hey, Catherine, would you turn so off your video? I would, um, hey, Catherine, Ka Catherine, would you turn off your video so that whatever data you have streaming, it will be less, it might work better? Yeah, let me try that. But we can see your screen just fine. I'll pull that back up. My computer's got a, it's just had a lag lately, so it's kind of annoying. Okay, stop video. Stop video today. All right, there we are. Let me share screen again. That was a nice trick. Hmm. Much better. Yay. Oh, good. You can look at my doggy then. <laughs> okay. So, um, so we would, so they would shout out those answers um, in the classroom. I would write those answers down on a whiteboard, um, but instead we just kind of sit and listen. Um, and then, uh, and then we could open that up. So we would open up that clinical pattern uh, picture, and then we'd say, "Okay, a couple of you were correct." Um, so we, 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 absolutely, many people guessed cervical radiculopathy. Um, so we would look at that, and then we would talk about that the, the, the different diagnoses. We would see and acknowledge the correct answers, and perhaps um, have a quick discussion as to why one answer might not have been the most appropriate. So then the next, um, I would ask the students, uh, what, do you, what would you expect to see on an initial evaluation for this patient? That way they're anticipating common tests and measures that are appropriate for that diagnosis and kind of be prepared for which tests would be most appropriate for them to follow up in the coming visits. Um, we would then look at the clinical findings video. So I would click on that, go to clinical findings, and again, kind of get an idea. Okay, this is what this patient looks like. We just discussed what we were anticipating what this patient would look like. Um, we would then open up um, other parts of this. Uh, one of my favorites, uh, so we would talk about the clinical findings we would expect. Um, which would also include movement faults. And I love the movement fault videos because, you know, I can, I can fake it um, in the classroom and say, okay, as I, as I uh, raise my arms up, you can see my, uh, my scapula is elevating or I'm going into increased cervical extension. Um, or, so having them see that and then they can look at that on their own, rewind it, look at it again, um, and then I love that because common movement faults, that, that can help you direct your treatment focus. So I feel those videos are invaluable. After that class, the students would be given um, the clinical reflection worksheet. So that clinical reflection worksheet we were just talking about, um, I would have them on three specific diagnoses. I'd say, okay, for the rest of the day, go through Physio U and look at these things. Look at the clinical findings video, Think about and then look at the key findings, look at the movement faults, and then my favorite thing for them to really zero in on, because as PTAs, they're not expected to come up with the, um, the tests and measures that are going to be appropriate, but that doesn't mean I don't want them anticipating what tests and measures they should be seeing um, and and. What, should, what it should look like. If it's a radiculopathy, they're gonna be expecting certain things and other things will not be expected. And as you know, many of our patients come in with, multi, with the histories of multiple things that can overlap and, and um, occlude what you're really needing to focus on. Um, 
So then the next day, um, we would uh, zero in on that worksheet, or actually we would zero in on the um, uh, case studies. So here's an example of a case study. Let me look at that. So we would start start looking at a case study and I would read out, this is what this patient looks like. This is their primary complaint, mechanism of injury, um, pertinent medical history. And then after I got done with that, I would stop and say, what are you hoping that primary PT measured? What are you thinking? What are, are you already expecting to see? I want them to have a, a, a picture of what they're expecting. And so then they'd say, oh, maybe they looked at range of motion. Maybe they looked at strength. Maybe they looked at nerve uh, ten or, uh, um, upper limb nerve tension. And so then we would scroll through and say, okay, they looked at the, they looked at posture. They looked at manual muscle testing. They looked at cervical range of motion. And, and lo and behold, some of these things that we were expecting to see, we are seeing. Um, and I had, um, I lucked out because I, like, this was pretty last minute. Uh, my uh, faculty and I um, quickly drafted up 24 case studies um, for this last minute course. So I am forever in their debt. Um, so we would, um, so then I would place them in, we would go through what was the treatment. Um, I would, if, if somebody post, uh, uh, popped up with a question, well, what's the Cody sign or, or what does that mean? Or in the treatment, um, what what is what is that treatment? And then I would say that's a, and a very good question. You're not going to know the name of every single test out there. So I want you to be aware of that and don't be down on yourself if you don't know what that special test means because your your primary PT may be working off a special test that they honed in on a decade ago or two decades ago, and they may still really love that special test. And you might not have heard of it because we might not be teaching that one particular special test. So I, but that still doesn't excuse you from knowing what that is. Um, if I see inconsistencies in how we've documented each uh, faculty member, I kind of love that and I don't necessarily correct them because I want them to see okay, look, they did a, a maybe they did, a, like today there was a joint mobilization technique done in the um, um, evaluation, but when they looked at the plan, the therapeutic content did not include joint mobilization techniques. So then I would, I asked the students, so what are you gonna do? And then somebody said, well, in the daily plan, it says to improve joint mobility. And I said, okay, you have something there, you've got an argument for that, I would still go and check with your primary PT, maybe ask them to do an addendum to the initial eval, if, if both of you really agree that joint mobilization has to happen with this patient, then have them put an addendum on the initial evaluation and uh, they're gonna co-sign your note, everybody knows that you're gonna do this and everybody should be fine with it at that point. Um, or maybe they had a reason for not including it. And so then you have that dialogue. You have to have that dialogue with your primary PT. So we would look over this. I would put them in Zoom rooms so that, well, a little chat room so that they could then answer these questions with each other. Second visit, what are the questions you're going to ask this patient? How, is the, how are you going to proceed with your ideas of what an appropriate treatment is? Um, you're not just going to reproduce what everybody else has been doing. So that is, that's cheating. So, oh, they did joint mobs last time. I'll do joint mobs this time. Well, what if they come in and they have full cervical range of motion? Why are you going to do joint mobilization? So that's um, not appropriate. They already have the, the range. You do not need to mobilize it anymore. Now, what are you going to do? So they need to ask the questions. How are you feeling? So I have them come up with all these questions. They discuss it with each other. They decide what is the, um, the objective finding that they're the most interested in that they might use as a pre and post. Um, and uh, then they would specifically um, list out a few interventions that they thought were appropriate. Um, and then during those um, sessions, I'd pop in, listen to their discussions, make myself available to answer any questions. And then after the breakouts, I will call on individual students and say, okay, Robert, um, what questions are you gonna ask this patient? And then have him list out what he would do. 
I would ask somebody else, okay, you know, Randy, what are you going to ask? And, and I'm looking for the specific questions that I think are appropriate. And if I don't hear it, I might ask, I might keep prompting them. Um, and then, um, uh, and then I would just continue individual students say, okay, um, uh, Winnie, how are you going to progress this patient's um, home program? And then, or regress it. And then I might give them additional information on the case, like, well, your patient didn't tolerate that stretch. So now what are you going to do? Um, so try to, you know, provide opportunities for them to think on their feet. Um, and then that afternoon, after we reviewed the case study, um, and we might even go back over um, to um, the, the um, physio U and say, well, yeah, you guys listed, um, you, you listed that as a treatment option. And look at that, it's a treatment option that's in physio U. And my computer's not gonna um, cooperate with me here. Um, so we would go back and say, okay, and then, you know, let's look at that. Let's review that treatment um, and notice how the therapist is positioning themselves in this way. Um, today, someone was asking about joint mobilization. Um, there was a wrist mobe that was a mobilization with movement. And somebody said, well, I thought you needed to do all joint mobes in an open pack position. And this is a patient who's at end range wrist extension. And I said, well, the, it's a mobilization with movement. And remember, we're trying to increase through that range of motion. So you're right. The joint play is going to be maximized in a loose pack position, but in order to facilitate more range of motion, that particular treatment strategy utilizes that patient actually actively moving and providing their own overpressure. So then even though they didn't learn mobilization with movement, I think mobilization with movement is um, a, an amazing um, adjunct to what we do. Um, and uh, I want them to be aware um, that it's out there. Um, and so then I would give them additional homework, like uh, additional webinars or YouTube videos, but also then the, the gate uh, case studies, um, I also gave as homework based on the particular diagnosis that we had covered. And then um, I would stress um, with the students, I want you to make sure you're going over the patient education part of this. Because PhysioU does give really great information about patient education. So I would say, okay, tonight I want you to read the patient education on this diagnosis. And I want you to read it out loud. And then I want you to find someone, whether it's your mom or your dog, and I want you to explain, dog, this is why your, uh, uh, your elbow hurts. And so, you know, just practice that. Um, and so then the schedule would repeat with the next body region. And, um, and that's basically how we got through uh, four weeks of um, not having clinicals. We just completed that. Uh, uh, we completed week four today. Uh, we have covered the time that we needed uh, for the, our program to count this as a course. Uh, I really think the students did quite well. Uh, they were answering those clinical questions much quicker, identifying the common patterns and treatment strategies a lot easier, and really getting a sense for visualizing what that patient should look like with a particular diagnosis. And I asked them today, if you walked into a clinic right now, and it was like 1104, and I said, and your primary PT or CI said, you have a patient at 1130, do you know right now what you would do? And then, you know, the obvious, uh, you know, things were blurted out like panic, pray, scream, cry. And then they started saying, well, I would want to see the initial evaluation. I'd want to review the initial evaluation and other treatments if they had been in, in for more than one treatment and, and get a, an, a sense for whether what the therapists were working on was actually helping. And then I would want to come up with some subjective questions and see how they're feeling today. So that really, you know, what they couldn't get in an actual clinical setting was really um, what I was really hoping that they would get some, some comfort in so that when they do finally get into a clinical setting, they're not feeling like, um, you know, COVID ripped them off of their um, experience. Um, and I am 100% um, forever grateful for having a PhysioU um, 
literally fall into my lap. And um, we, I know that uh, my um, colleague, uh, when she gets to um, cardiopulmonary, is going to be utilizing uh, PhysioU to um, help augment what she's um, already planning on teaching. So um, I am super thankful and um, I'm loving it. Okay, well that um, brings us really close to uh, to wrapping up. Um, I know that. Um, let's see if I can find this. So my um, colleague Tracy Williams, who's on the call here, um, likes having things for ducks in a row. And when we first started Physio U, using Physio U, she went and said, "Okay, what are the apps?" And back then, I think there were two, maybe three. And then just the other day, she went back in, listed all the apps, listed what is in all the apps. Um, anyway, Jennifer has this document, which is another way to sort of find the breadcrumbs, okay, for different different kinds of learning styles. Um, and and oh. Lori, I would just say that um, it's valuable for if you show everybody how you got to um, the master cheat sheet, I think that would be really valuable. I mean, I can do it real quick. I did. If, yeah, I, well, I already did. You may have stepped away. When oh, no, I, I saw that, it. But... I saw it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, go ahead then. Carry on. No, go ahead. You're oh, right there. Yeah. So here under faculty resources, this is another version of what Lori just showed, which means that as you're thinking about your class that's coming up. So fall's coming up, we've got a new group coming. I need to be prepared for my range of motion manual muscle test class. All you have to do here is do a quick search. I need all the shoulder palpations. I need all of the shoulder range of motion. I'm just copying and pasting these videos into my lab sheet. And usually what I do is I'll click on the link and take a screenshot of the technique that I'm trying to demonstrate and I add that into my lab because we know that visual triggers will help them with the learning of the of the skill and so I just add these images in and all of those images are now hyperlinked to the technique so your students now have the ability to go in and preview all the techniques that you're going to teach them for that week imagine how much anxiety is reduced and how organized that feels for them Instead of like, I'm going to show you a bunch of stuff on Zoom, hope that you got it, and then we're going to move on to the next joint. So I was just going to add that little point in. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's, um, it really does make it easy. And in fact, I took that, um, uh, if I can find it real quick, maybe not. Um, yeah, it's right here. I did, I did the same thing in a document that I did for um, a patient and we're going to learn some bed mobility for this patient. We're going to learn some exercises. Um, and I did the same screenshot right here, which I like very awesome. much. Um, I procure a lot from Michael because he does it so well. Um, okay. The, we just had some last words of wisdom. Um, So everybody can see my PowerPoint this time. So here's our last slide, our little, our takeaways, if you will. Start simple. As with anything this complex, it, it can be overwhelming. Um, maybe assign each student one video in one topic for them to then present to the rest of the class, a gate pattern, a special test. Um, assign one topic and video and then ask students to select a related um, item to compare. Use the cheat sheet to identify your desired content. Um, use that lab worksheet example to drive student exploration and to guide discussions. Use the case studies and attend Michael's webinars. Um, and I had done a screenshot of this, but he showed you where to find them under faculty resources, deep dive webinars. Um, I know we, we kind of sound like a cult, but honest to goodness, 
I don't know where we would have been in these last few weeks without um, using physio. You, I really, I just really don't. Um, Michael's uh, has an incredible team. Um, I will say I did see a chat. So were you put up on my case study physical therapy assistant, your physical therapist assistant? If you would have them change that right now, we'd all be really, really happy. Yeah, absolutely. It will be changed before tomorrow, guys. It will be changed before tomorrow, <laughs> even before the meeting's over. <laughs> like I said, hashtag ask Mike. Right. That's all we have. I'm going to go back to the chats. There was a question about integumentary system. Um, is there anything on the integumentary system or anything in the works related to integument? Yeah. You know what? I'm going to show you. Um, I'm going to share screen in just one second here. So okay. here's the thing about integumentary. We had been designing an app. Uh, and I'm not so sure the content is the issue. I think it's the clinical reasoning that's the issue. So let me share screen here. I'm going to show you, we are building simulations for the students to play. So let me go to, where is my Chrome browser here? Google, perfect. So I'm going to give you a glimpse as to integumentary. So here is my wound care. We have built about 50 simulations related to orthopedics. We will start building them for cardiopulmonary and neuro as well. Um, and let me see, wound care maybe, um, let's see, okay, here we go. So, uh, I'm super excited about this. Um, I'm going to show you this here. The students need a space to make decisions. And so what we decided was we were going to create games for the clinicians to play, to learn how to apply their knowledge. So here's your patient coming in, and this is the wound that they see. So what kind of wound is it? What should you do to determine, you know, uh, what do you need to do next? Well, I need to debride the wound to determine the stage. So now I can apply the different appropriate devices Oops, let me try that again. And I'm gonna keep debriding. And all of a sudden I have the wound that I can use for them to apply their knowledge. So I can't even, even remember half of this stuff, but we have a wound care specialist that's building this with us. Uh, and we're collecting images as well. So let's just say granulation and some other thing like Okay. Yeah, I hear some of you connecting with this. This is great. And uh, you debride the wound and see yellow stuff. What will you do next? So we want to actually talk a little bit about, oh, I need to debride. I need to clean this up. And now we need to take a look at staging. We need to start measuring things. Can you imagine what the future of integumentary looks like? And, and I'll tell you the reason why we're building this is because uh, it's a big problem in our board pass rates. Not because the content isn't being delivered well, it's because the application doesn't exist. The students don't get to see this in the clinic. Isn't this really cool? So then they're like, okay, let's measure the height of the wound. So w when we went over this with the wound care specialist, we said, you know, what else should we add in? Well, let's make them enter the measurement. Um, let's see. Let's, you notice possible tunneling. Let's take a look. And now measure the tool, measure. I don't even remember exactly. You can see what we're doing here is um, we are, and then there's application of dressings. The wound gets worse if you make a bad choice. The wound gets better. We are building PTA specific simulations as well. So if you think about all the orthopedic simulations, we're thinking the patient should come back and I'm going to leave this particular case because now that kind of answers the, the integumentary question. This is how I envision answering 
the um, the integumentary problem in our education. If you think about playing the PTA sim, we have reorganized the simulation so that Jerry Maguire is on your schedule today. So let's do a chart review. We want them to go through a process that is consistent and to gather information that is meaningful. Here are the common questions that we're going to expect every assistant to ask. So here's the information that they've gathered. Here is the questionnaire, right, the outcome, outcome measure. We want them to be able to think about it, to deal with it, because we don't have time to talk about it in class. I want them to deal with it when they're at home playing this on their own. And it says that uh, based on Jerry's report of a fall, right, so we purposely, based on my conversations with many of you, have said, let's not make these cases too straightforward. So this patient comes in and they had a fall. What should I do? Should I just carry on with the treatment? Or should I call in the primary therapist to make an assessment on whether to continue to continue care or refer out? So I, so I did the Ottawa knee rule, the, P, the PT did the no, Ottawa knee rule, and they were negative. So we, proceed, we decide to proceed with treatment, and the plan of care calls for a grade 4 mobilization. So now, and I remember one of the chats said, hey, in your app, there's a lot of techniques that aren't relevant, like it's not appropriate for the PT student, a PTA student to do. That's exactly right. This is part of the conversation. It is going to be a messy world that the students are coming into. And these cases can help them decide, you know what, I'm not going to do the mobilization. I'm going to have the primary therapist jump in and do the mobilizations before I apply the stretching exercises. So when they do the right thing, the patient gets better. When they do the wrong thing, the guy grabs his knee and it's, it's swollen. And so we are going to continue to build tools that will make your job easier and make the students learning that much deeper. So I want, I want you to give you a glimpse that we are working really hard and, and listening to what are the things that you need so that we can continue to evolve the education and take it to a higher level. So I, I, I'll just stop there for a sec and uh, take any other comments or questions. And, and this, of course, is open to the entire, entire uh, presentation team that did such an amazing job. Just going to look down through the chat, Michael, and make sure, sure we've answered everybody's. Because I know some questions popped up, but they were answered as we went. Right. Um, And I think the answer was in the chat about manual muscle testing books. People are still using those. Um, uh, there was a question, Michael, from, Re from Rebecca. Um, some of the exams have in references for those that do not. Can they email you and request a reference for um, things that are on the app yeah, without a reference? Absolutely. There are, uh, for example, um, the range of motion manual muscle test, we have benchmarked first. Uh, the textbook that we used in our in our program, which is uh, Berryman Reese, Nancy Berryman Reese, we find that to be a very good textbook in general. Now, as the different schools have come in and said, "Hey, I do MMT a slightly different," we started filming some alternative positions. So now, for the manual muscle test for hip flexion, grade zero through two, or uh, we have a, a couple of options. And so, part of the problem is we have too many options. So we have tried our best to first make a logical, reasonable choice. These are the best techniques that we think we, we can try to homogenize the profession a little bit. And then as faculty push back and say, nope, this is a technique. I think it's really good. It's important. We vet it among the faculty, our, our education team. And then we decide, should we add more or is volume the enemy of learning? Is having too many options not a good thing for our students? And so I think that's also something that we always have to consider uh, in the PTA education as well as in PT education. What is too much? What is enough to get them to entry level so that we can help them master the entry level skills? And then how do we create simulations and context? What I really was excited to see is that you are leveraging the app and the entirety of the app, meaning a lot of these clinical patterns, yes, they have PT examination in there. How powerful is it for a PTA student to see 
what a therapist would have done for this type of cervical radiculopathy. So all of a sudden, those special tests, Sperling's test, distraction tests, they all make sense all of a sudden because they saw the big picture. And they were able to connect that to the interventions. They were able to see the associated impairments. To me, that is the dream of how the apps are being used, not just as a library of video techniques, but in fact, the ability to create context. And so the things that you're doing, Lori, in terms of the worksheets, how you can guide students into the app using questions and cases is really, really how the apps should be leveraged. Michael, do you have a sense of when the PTA app is going to be released? You mean the uh, simulations? So, um, I believe that's what she's referencing. I think so. Yeah, so related to the simulations, I would say we have about five PTs and PTAs working together to create the simulations. The first round that we're going to release are the PT simulations. Now, let me just say that the PT simulations are so simple. Like, there's no real examination there. We just offer examination findings. So really, it's, it's like looking at a soap note and making decisions about treatments and interventions. So the PT sims that are like knee arthritis, shoulder impingement, frozen shoulder, those games that we're going to release in the first round are completely appropriate for the PT assistant. They are going to get to see the big picture and play through some simple decisions. This, the, the second half of every sim is actually the PTA portion in, in, in reality. It's the day two visit. Here's the soap note. Here's the questions you need to ask. The patient is actually sore from their exercise. Should you progress or should you regress the exercise? So in fact, the PTA specific sim I had secretly built in because day two is built in there. But I really think that when the PTA student plays through the beginning part, because we're not asking them to make decisions about what to examine. We're actually giving them the findings of the neuro exam, findings of the special test, findings of the uh, range of motion impairments. So for the students to actually see, oh, Nears and Hawkins Kennedy, I remember that. Yeah, this person has an arc of pain. All of that, I think, really is even, even more powerful than just saying, hey, here's day two because they actually get to see all these pieces that are floating around in their mind played out in a patient scenario. And it's low stakes, it's asynchronous. It's something that they do on the weekend. So I think uh, the PTA, I have that in mind. It, it's, it's a passion of mine. Um, uh, but the first 50 sims that we are vetting through faculty right now, they will probably be, we'll start releasing them in the next couple of months because it's a whole different software, it's a whole different hosting mechanism. Um, and I think where they're going to show up is right here. So if I go back to Google Chrome, they're going to show up here. So if you're like, here is PhysioU, I need my students to play through the week in the weekend some simulations, it's going to go right here. You'll see a simulations button and they'll be able to choose three shoulder patients. Any other comments or questions? I was going to say something as far as uh, when you, to kind of follow through with the previous uh, kind of question, one of the things, and that's also when I've talked to the DPT faculty, I kind of, we got on and did a Zoom meeting too, and I'm like, what are you finding that are great? And what's this so that I can potentially share as well? And one of those things, it's great that there are potential different, it's a jumping off part for the manual muscle test. And so these are the book that we're utilizing for this. Uh, realize that there are other ways to do things there are other manual muscle tests and that's also something important if you're going and we i learned in pt school for uh dorsiflexion uh dorsiflexion and plantar flexion you lined up with the calcaneus and not the fifth metatarsal um you need to find out what your pt if you're looking at their eval and they line up that way and we teach line up at the fifth metatarsal, there's going to be a potential difference. So it's, it's one of those things to really be kind of a jumping off part, realize that not everything is completely standardized, uh, that there are different things coming out of there. And uh, in addition, that just kind of gives that, but at the same time, you also need to really uh, 
but that physio you is is that you have to buy in you want your faculty to buy in uh to it and not just be like oh well, i looked at a couple of things and i didn't like how that was done and so we're throwing out the baby with the bath water like knowing that and and saying and it's it's the same thing as if if your patient comes in and the doctor has told them something that is not necessarily you don't just be like well that doctor has no idea it's like how you address that and learn that uh that that verbiage um, and so I think that's one of the things too, is to really realize, and, and the same thing, there was some talk about doing uh, mobilizations and those type of things that are, that are potentially some things that may be outside of the scope or outside of where we're teaching, uh, them still knowing that technique, uh, it's that that's what the PT did. Um, this is where I can come into that is also important as well. Michael, there's a question if there's a video or webinar that you um, talk about constructing the lab worksheets. You cover um, that in one of your webinars. Yeah, you know, in the cardiopulmonary uh, deep dive, so here under deep dive webinar series, in the cardiopulmonary web webinar series, I talk about how I've created, um, uh, in fact, right here, I talk about how we use it and how we've created it so that for each of the common conditions, so let me go to teaching content. Here is the cardiopulmonary pattern, cardiopulmonary patterns. There is a worksheet for each of the common patterns. So if the students go in and play through restrictive lung disease or obstructive lung disease, they will actually have learned the examination, the intervention, they would have watched a video of how the patient presents. All of that is built in already because CardiPoem has five conditions. Ortho has 10 conditions in one body region. So for the, um, that particular deep dive webinar, you will get to see how we use this. And the orthopedic webinar as well, I talk a little bit more about using the clinical pattern recognition worksheet for the ortho side. So yes, I would say the, I think the next step for faculty who are more, who are still interested is to go to the faculty resources and say, I'm, I'm going to be teaching the fundamental series. Here are my early clinical foundation courses. So I, I think you should go and watch this or sign up for the webinars. These are coming once a week for, for the next month but they're already recorded for you. So here's my PDF, as well as some tips and tricks on using our fundamental apps for your classroom. Or if you're in orthopedics or in neuro, I think for the neuro group, it is very valuable for you to go and watch the neuro deep dive. There's some really good ideas there. You'll see a lot of our new apps that are coming out. So you can actually begin to plan ahead uh, for fall, knowing that you do not need to film any PNF videos, any NDT videos, any neuro exam videos, like all of that is going to be ready for you to reference and access. So I would just invite you to go and find the area that you know that you're going to have to teach in and then jump in and watch one of the deep dive series. Or I'm happy to jump online as well. If you want to reach out, uh, mike at physiou.com, I'm happy to jump in with you on a call to jump in on a faculty meeting if need be, so that faculty could just ask me directly, you know, we can plan and dream together. Thank you. I think that's all the questions from the chat. I just wanted to take a moment and thank everybody for sharing their information. Um, certainly, um, Michael, thank you so much for taking some time and for all that you have offered. Um, we really, really appreciate that. And as PTA educators, we. Are, are most grateful for all of the additional support and Absolutely. Um, applications that are relevant um, and that are specific to PTA education as well. So thank you for that. And uh, Carrie and Kathy and Lori, thanks for sharing um, your information as well. Um, everybody can kind of keep their eyes out for upcoming webinars. Uh, I'll try to get uh, the information out. We are probably not going to have the same frequency that we've had um, on a weekly basis. Um, we're going to taper back a little bit. Um, I know I've been getting um, some information from people that are going back and watching some things now that their schedules have slowed down a little bit too. So um, uh, with that, I think we'll close this evening. And thanks everyone for uh, 
for joining us tonight. Thank yes. you. And Jennifer, you you mentioned that um, the, this has been recorded. We'll be yes, happy sir. to host this as well on our site as people are looking for this resource. So I'll just touch okay. base with you about that and we can send a link out to everybody. But all Perfect. of these videos will be hosted here, probably in recorded webinars. Absolutely. Great. Thank you, everybody. Thank nice you. Nice work. Good night, all. Good night.